My last appointment was uh, as the Army Field Commander or Panglima Medan, they call it. I was in the Na Royal Malaysian Navy. I am from the Air Force. Elite uh, Royal Ranger Regiment. My name is My name is Chia Leong Boon. My rank is Captain Navy. I retired. I was in the Na Royal Malaysian Navy. I retire as a captain. I stay in the Navy for 27 years. My name is Pak Singh, P-A-K, which is uh, on my back, and I am from the Air Force. Uh, I have been an air crew for about uh, 20 years. We were flying the uh, helicopters, Sikorsky helicopters, and most of my years of service is while uh, doing operations in this country during the hot time during communist uh, insurgency. I retired in the year 1989. My name is Lieutenant General uh, Datuk Sri Zaini bin Muhammad Said. Uh, that was my last rank. Uh, my last appointment was uh, as the Army Field Commander or Panglima Medan they call it in Sungai Besi where I commanded the Army Field Field Army rather. And I started service in 1965, uh, commissioned into the Royal Malay Regiment. My name is uh, Captain Panir Chalvam, well item, my father's name. Born in 1954, March 4th. I'm uh, 65 years old and uh, I served the Army in the elite uh, Royal Ranger Regiment uh, from 1973 until 1985. I joined the Navy in 1953 at the age of 19. 19 years old. I was 19 years old. So just over 19 years old. Why I, jo I joined the military? Uh, probably because my school, when I was in primary school, the camp, Gurkha camp they call, was located near my school. So uh, virtually every other day, we will be looking at the uh, soldiers doing march pass and all that. So that could be one of the reasons why uh, military life appealed to me at that uh, sensitive age. Uh, reason? In 1963, as you know, Malaysia was formed, but it was opposed by Indonesia and uh, they sent troops across and uh, we had confrontasi and that angered me a little bit, you know. And that is one motivation or one reason why I said I must join the military. The reason I joined is I was looking for a job and this guy came up with an interesting uh, advertisement to join the Navy, you chose to be interviewed in Singapore. And they say that he was shortlisted for interview, they will give you Malaysian Railway free to Singapore, free and back. And I've never been on Malaysian Railway before, see? So that's why I say, okay, why not for the heck of it, go and try. At those days, uh, it was a hobby. For me, I was a Agong Scout. I think the most uh, significant one was actually in my last days of service. I was involved in an incident to neutralize the Al Mauna group. That is the group that did the heist and, and stole uh, hundreds of wep uh, weapons, high powered rap weapon M16, and also thousands of rounds. And they had this aim of trying to topple down the government through violent means to a form of insurrection. So that is, uh, and then we, we quickly cornered them and uh, wear them down through psychological operations and uh, uh, harassment. And in the end, we even managed to capture the whole group alive. Uh, but we lost two, one, two people, one a soldier, a commando, uh, and a policeman during the incident. Actually, the Air Force don't get involved in arm-to-arm uh, -arm combat. We do supportive roles. We go in uh, anytime, wherever there's danger. We insert troops into the uh, power location. We are the first to go in where the troops are sitting in the helicopter. We either land or abseil them down or winch them down so they can go on hot pursuit. Our tasking is if they're hit, we take them out. If they're, uh, they're down, we'll take their body out. And, uh, and if they're hungry, we'll feed them, we'll drop 
if you can't land, we'll drop food from the sky. There was one uh, incident in, uh, on the 26th of July, 1983. We were stationed in Kuantan. We were tasked late in the evening that there were two of our soldiers shot in Karak. We got airborne from Kuantan uh, about uh, 23 minutes to last light. So when we got airborne, to reach that location, it takes about more than an hour. So we were flying at night. And those time, we do not have the modern, modern facilities of uh, night navigations and uh, you know, locations and all that. So we used our two eyeballs to search for the place. We were told that location is in Karat. We pinpoint the place and we got there. But it was dark, very, very dark. We tried to hover on top of that particular location to pick up those wounded soldiers. But the cable of 370 feet will not reach the ground. And there was no fire or no indication that those people down there are soldiers. They could be cities. So we winched up, we just left. And then I saw a lot of lights, torch lights and uh, you know, motorbike lights. And then we thought, oh, that's a location, let's go in. As we descend to go into land, Six Sense tells me, no, overshoot. So we overshot. Then I thought, two wounded soldiers, we must try and go in again. Second time, more lights. This time I confirmed in my sixth sense that no, overshoot. So we went straight to Bentong to land. And the person who came running to the helicopter was uh, General T. Selvaraja. He was the commander in chief, asking me, huh, where are my wounded soldiers? I told him, Dato, sorry. We cannot go in. So we left. He says, never mind, go to Ops room, relax. There, he was. we were told, uh, after a little bit of hassle, talking to him, and he says, where did you see all those lights coming up? Those lights were getting, that was very near to Chinese New Year. So he says, uh, he says, Lord, all your soldiers going to discipline, playing at the jungle with torchlight and all this and that. And later on, after a little bit of uh, small talk to calm everybody down, he says, but I only got, 11 soldiers in that location, nobody else. Where do you see all the lights? Boom, it hit me. We are lucky to be out. But that night I couldn't sleep because the bullets who hit those soldiers were still there. We thought for a while, next morning, first light. The moment you can see our crew, we were three of us on the helicopter. So we got airborne, we went to the location, and there's a huge tree, a very huge tree in Karat where the soldiers were covering themselves under the tree because it's huge. So we had to winch down and I can't reach it. Because while uh, winching, I am in com control of the aircraft. So I told the pilot, come back, back a little bit. I can see the whole wingspan of the helicopter. Come back, back, back. And he was telling me, you all right? Okay, back. Now come down. He says, ah, we might hit this. Tree. I said, no, I can see the blaze, come down, back. Because if you're on top of the tree, the downwash will open up the jungle. But when you're below, the branches won't come down. So we went down, back, down, slightly lower than the particular tree, and I picked up both the wounded soldiers. After picking them up, we came back out, got up and straight to GHKL. We dropped them in GHKL. And then we went for breakfast in uh, Subang. While having breakfast, message came from Kuantan, RTB immediately. So we thought, well, something must be good. And that, when the moment we went in, the commanding officer there ran to the aircraft and said, you're grounded, you're grounded. And when we get grounded, we lose a lot of flying pay. It's okay, so fine. Then my commander, from the squadron commander, his name is Chong Keng Lei, he called me. The park tell me what happened. So I told him, you were the army before. These two army soldiers were in that location, wounded. And if I don't do that, if they die. The guilt will be on me all life through. And you are a soldier, if you were there, I will still go in and pick you up. He looked at me for, him for a while and then he says, okay. You wait for four hours, after that you go and fly. It's clear. Two days later, I was pulled up, sent to KL to do some paperwork and uh, they gave me this, this is called 
This is uh, Taming Sari. Tara. Don't go outside. Cha. Let He gave me. This is a gallantry award. There was one operation launched by the brigade together with the uh, uh, police. That ops was called Ops Paga. This operation was launched whereby in the history of armed forces, it's the first time such magnitude, large-scale operation was launched under the disguise of uh, police uniform. We were wearing, we were asked to wear, wear green and we were taken in a police truck towards Greek. Around uh, 6 p.m., getting dark, they moved from there to the uh, given place, uh, just using a prismatic compass. And uh, when we reached roughly that area, uh, we sighted the Claymore mines, faced the enemy Claymore mines, where it has got uh, 5,000 ball bearings inside and the firing device was in my hand. Total pitch darkness. We saw torchlights coming from the back of us. That area is curfew, so the, there shouldn't be any movements. We saw the light coming nearer, very close, about 30 meters. Left flanking was Lance Corporal Hassan. He saw, his, he, they came towards him, very close, he opened fire. When he opened fire, all of us opened fire, and there was a exchange of this thing. We heard the shout, chow, that means run away. But the, the communist terrorists ran away. And uh, I stopped firing, asked them to ask my people to stop firing. 10 o'clock, we were in uh, combat position. I heard the uh, shrubs, dry leaves sound coming close to us. So I knew that the enemies making another attempt to assault us because they knew through the flash of gun that we are under strength. I was given the uh, extra ammunition. I was given uh, five M36 grenades. And uh, I took out one granite, took out the pin. Once you take out the pin, <laughs> you have to throw. I just threw it at that. Fortunately, that granite didn't hit any tree and bounce back. One, two, three, four, five, boom. Malatuk. And uh, it was so near, the soil, everything dropped on us. After that, quiet. I saw a lot of bag galas, you know, the bags, white bags and all this scattered. And right in front of me, I saw one body. I got up, went there finished my one magazine of uh, ammunition on him. The first light came around 5.30, 6 o'clock. You can see the, the brightening, you know, the morning sun. And uh, went up the air, uh, sundry to sundry means commander to commander. I asked permission to follow the blood trails. And I was told, no, you are under strength. We will send you a... Uh, uh, additional troop, they will replace you. But I still insisted I need, I will go only one map square, that's about one mile. Corporal Kamarudin was with me. He saw the the, the uh, bushes, uh, what he called moving. Then we went into cover, then we looked, we saw one person holding the weapon. Uh, Corporal Kamarudin shouted, Temba, Temba Tuan. I said, Jangan Temba Dulu. Nanti. I started engaging with the enemy and told him to surrender and he put down and went and caught him. Caught him, brought him back to the place where the dead city kill in action and asked him who is this? He said he's the commander of that group, 15 of them. So together with the body and the captured enemy personnel, we took to a place RV given by the brigade commander, Brigadier, uh, Brigadier General uh, Hassan Saleh, and Tansri CPO there, they hugged us and they said, fantastic. The year confrontation was 64, 66, 1964. We were all captain of small patrol boats. I was a captain of minesweeper. As a minesweeper, I commissioned in England. We sailed all the way back. That time was curfew in uh, Singapore. Singapore was very bad at uh, the confrontation time, you know. So we do a lot of patrol, five-hour patrol, 
It's interesting, you know, the confrontation started by Sukarno in Indonesia. He did not declare a war. He will remember, just confrontation. So the, he doesn't like the way you form Malaysia. So if I can remember, Sukarno simply said, we just organized two battalions to go and cut out Malaysia. That's all. So you can see them, we were patrolling along uh, Singapore Strait, Malacca Strait, and then later we went to uh, Sabah, Sarawak there. Patrolling all the time, you can see the Indonesians there. It was a great relief. Everybody is so happy. They fly the national flag. Every house, every vehicle, you can see the national flag. They sing patriotic songs. And every time there's a national item being played, we stand up. We are very proud. And if we see a flag being raised, we stand still. And at that time, we are in uniform. We salute that particular flag because that is our identity. To me, at that point of time, honestly, Merdeka means a lot to us. You know, it is not just the flag, Union Jack coming down and Jalur Gemilang going up. It is that, that desire, that uh, the fighting spirit for the country. You know, you put your life in the line of fire uh, and uh, you want to safeguard every inch of the Malaysian soil against uh, foreign intrusion and uh, we will do anything to safeguard the, our country. Love was everywhere. There's no racial kind of things. There were no, no uh, race and racial by gods, big gods and things like that. And uh, it was such a such comradeship. I can still uh, feel uh, that that particular years where we were all together, harmony. Merdeka was 1957. At that time, I was still in Naval College in England. When I heard on the radio, because we don't have so much news, no handphone now in those days. When I heard about, on the news, you know, BBC News, Merdeka, I was very happy. At that time, our thoughts were, wow, we are now free. We can do what we want. We can uh, set our, our own course. We can control our, our country. We can have and provide for our own security and because we assume uh, not not really incorrectly that the uh, colonial masters took away took away a lot of our wealth so now we will be able to get the wealth you know enjoy it. so we we're hoping for good times stable time proud times and 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 a call a, a, a sort of a, a united uh, country That is a yes, yes and no sort of answer, you know, because now I see the modern generation is more concerned about making an income, feed, look at their family and all these things. But in a way, the peaceful part we like so much, no more fighting, no much confrontation. Whatever is happening now, today, I feel a bit sad because uh, we're not getting that equality which we are supposed to. We fought shoulder to shoulder with the police, with the army, with the border scouts and all those uniform branches who never cared for race, religion. The blood is the same. When you are hit, we are there. We go in with our life. We sold our life to the country, but we are still treated separately. Although, yes, you have to give a privilege to one race, fine, but do not allow some or few to split us up. They're splitting us up through race, religion, just for their political gain? Yes, because there are big segments of the population who are still, we love the country. But over the years, what has happened? Another segment of the population, they have moved away. They are more towards racial incitement, and uh, at, at some, some places, they, they, they even very lovingly called me Pandatang. I, I can't even mention it here, you know. For, for a person like us, okay, it's not that just because I got the Panglima Gagabrani for that particular operation, they, they look at me as if I'm an outsider. Not fully. This is the, the reality now. Uh, it is so obvious, you know that things uh, 
are not what it should be. You know, uh, we think we think we we tend to be even more. We 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 tend to be thinking purely about our own group, our own ethnicity, our own ideal. We forget the common, uh, the united ideals. We forget about that. No, we we express it. I know. Where we don't put it to work, or rather, we don't really work for it in a in in a really uh, true way, a correct way. Uh, secondly, the expectation was, wow, we should have a better share of the prosperity, but it has not come true. You know, the the country prospers, but there are still this uh, there's too many people or too a few people getting the bulk of the prosperity and the majority basically getting uh, just the smaller part. The third one is the sense of security. While we have our defenses correct and the troops, uh, the forces are there, there is a sense of insecurity that even more than what it was before. We should be more secure, feeling more secure, but we are not. We are beginning to feel our not the territorial in, uh, security or integrity, but our own, you know, national sense of security. We feel that we might be too, uh, too fragile, too uh, it can be broken up very easily. So it's not what I envisioned when uh, we were independent in 1957. The X and Y generations, they don't understand that nation building was not by any one single race. Nation building was by all races. No, it doesn't, of course. It changes. Time changes things, you know. The concept of Merdeka in the minds of people. People change, you know. The old ones are not there anymore. So the older ones think of Merdeka as, as it, okay, independent from colonial rule. We take over the government. We have we must do our own, be on our own to defend the country. But as we go along, as, uh, as the young ones coming up, they envision or they see Medeka in, in different light. They become it in more uh, global terms and uh, become a bit more wide in terms of their perspective. For me, yes. Freedom, actually freedom, as I say, freedom from the Masale controller, that, that I like very much, yeah. Of course, it's the same significance. We are free, we are no more victims of another country, but it is uh, not tak meriah lah in, uh, in Malay, you say tak meriah. Because people take it as this a holiday, let's go back home. They don't care. And the only people you see standing beside the road are the veterans and the school children who are forced to go there and who are given free flags or some to wave flags while walking. Where are the public that's supposed to be flying flags? Today you show me how many cars in our country are flying the national flag. I have a feeling they don't know very much. They don't know very much. Is this is my feeling? They don't know very much, and the young fellows must be educated in school. And the school don't. I don't think the school teach all these things anymore. So very sad. I think to them it's a holiday. That's what they think. Oh, Madeka, holiday, let's go back or let's go somewhere. But they give you a holiday to celebrate with other people, other races, other... You come and see the fly pass and see how the army has suffered. Quite pathetic. The, the semangat is lacking and uh, the crowd is not there. What it shows that the current uh, generation, they are moving away with this sort of feeling for the country and the flag. And uh, I think uh, we must go back like those days, bring the crowd, celebrate this important uh, date for, in the history of Malaysia. A lot of them don't really, you know, seem to know and don't seem to, they're, they're a little bit hazy uh, in these things. Uh, one reason is because when you talk about Mendeka in spirit and in form, it is more or less attached, uh, or they view it as that's the country, that's the government, you know. They don't really view it as a person, you know, or as a, a society. 
So when they don't, then they don't have any idea or concern for it because they say, well, you know, that's not my business. So if you say, if you ask me that question, what do the young people think about Merdeka? To me, it is just a day of reminding them, well, we were once uh, colonized and now we are, we are free. We will have a holiday. <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs>